Hi, I'm Peter Trude, and with me on the couch is Professor Maria Skylas Kazakis, Emeritus Professor in the School of Chemical Sciences and Engineering at UNSW and the inventor of the vanadium redox battery. Maria, the vanadium redox battery was quite a breakthrough. It's not one that's well known. Can you tell us how it works? The vanadium redox flow battery is a flow battery. Flow battery, the whole concept of flow battery was initiated by NASA back in the 1970s. But their system, the, the, the one that they developed, had some fundamental problems. And we looked at the, those problems and we came up with a solution which was the use of vanadium in both of the half cells. So what you've developed, or what you developed back then, was a battery where the energy is stored in a charged liquid, which is what a flow battery is about. That's but the right. breakthrough with vanadium was that it enabled these batteries to store much larger amounts of energy? Well, compared to the NASA system, you can get more vanadium dissolved per litre than the, the elements that they were using. So it does allow you to, use, to, to store more energy per litre, and that's true. But it was more the fact that it overcomes the problem of cross-contamination, where you have two different elements in each of the solutions. They always mix when you start pumping them through the cell stack. By having the same element on both sides, any mixing of the solutions doesn't cause cross-contamination and therefore they can have an indefinite life, which means that your battery can last in, theoretically forever, although you have to replace certain components. So one of the really exciting parts, uh, one of the exciting points about the vanadium battery is it can store large amounts of energy for a very long time. Well, that's the thing. One of the limitations with other ty types of batteries is that whatever energy is used or stored is stored in a box. And so as much element that you can store in the box determines how much energy you can store. In flow batteries, the energy is stored outside the box in separate tanks. So you can make those tanks as big as you want and so that you can store energy that will last you for periods of hours or days, or if you, depending on your application. Now this is where vanadium redox batteries are really exciting in terms of renewable energy. Can you tell us how the redox battery provides a solution for connecting your wind power and solar power systems, other renewable systems, into the grid and storing energy long term? Well, one of the problems with, with using a big percentage of our power from renewable is the fact renewable is not a reliable source of energy. It's intermittent. The sun shines during the daytime, but not at nighttime. And when a cloud comes over, or we might have days of cloud, then there's no energy. Wind is blowing one minute and it can stop the next minute and you can't forecast it, you can't predict that it's going to keep on blowing. So you've got to, so that while you can put a certain amount of renewable energy onto the grid and use the grid as the buffer, once you get a, above a certain percentage, then it's really impossible for the grid operators to be able to, to know reliably whether they can deliver the power to their users. So if you put a battery uh, a, a redox battery into a system, it means that regardless of when the wind blows, you can store that That's power right. until it's needed. Exactly. This has been one of the main criticisms of renewable exactly. energy so far. Exactly. Exactly, and that's the whole thing. If we, by putting store, now people, governments are now re, uh, recognizing that. And in, in fact, in the US, energy storage has become a, sig a major component now of their whole smart grid um, program. And they realize that if they're going to now have a large proportion of renewable energy on the grid, they've got to have storage uh, in order to be able to buffer those, you know, vari the variability and the variations, and therefore allow a higher percentage of, uh, of intermittent energy onto the grid. The vanadium battery that you developed has been uh, in use for some time, but it's not widely known. And yet there are some very large installations around the world. Can you tell us where it is being used? I mean, that's the thing. There are quite a lot of installations of the vanadium battery around the world, but because they are not, you can't buy, you can't buy a vanadium battery in a, go into a shop and buy one, people are not really aware that it is being implemented and used already. Um, mainly in Japan, the Sumitomo Electric Industries have installed at least 20 large to medium uh, applications. Uh, the largest one to date has been a six megawatt hour. So it's four megawatts for one and a half hours. Um, it's, it's connected to a wind farm in Hokkaido. So it's, it's being used to actually store energy from the wind farm and deliver it to the grid. During how, many, how many houses can that power? That would be about two to three hundred houses, but the, theoretically you, you can you, know, you can make these modular and you can make them as big as you want, and that's the good thing about redox flow batteries. You can actually make fifty kilowatt modules, and you can st have tanks that will store you know tens and tens of kilowatt hours or megawatt hours. So you know, it, they are it's very suitable for large scale applications. Will we ever be seeing them in use in our homes or in our electric cars? Certainly, um, there's, a, there's no, I suppose 
the, the lower limit, I would say, would be about one kilowatt. The upper limit would be hundreds of megawatts in term, terms of size, because these are modular units. You can put them into big or smaller systems. So, in fact, the system that we are now working on is something that we could modularize, to, to, probably to the size of a refrigerator, so we could put it into an individual house, and that would be able to help uh, allow the householder to either store solar energy or even normal power uh, from the grid during off-peak times and then use it during peak times to, uh, to offset their power bills or to be able to store solar energy for their individual use. So why haven't we seen redox batteries in wider use in renewable energy systems so far? Okay, from the point of view of renewable energy, the problem has been to date that the renewable energy industry have really tried to advance their own agenda, which is a good thing. I mean, we've had to be able to have government assistance and support to be able to bring the cost down for wind energy, solar energy. And the only way you can do that is to have you know, government mandating the, the purchase of renewable power. So because the governments have mandated that the user, the distributors or the grid utilities have had to buy the power, from the renewable energy companies, there's been no need for storage because they know that they can sell the power to the grid regardless of whether the grid needs it or not. And that's why there's just been no need for storage. But now that as the percentage of renewable energy in certain parts of the world is becoming quite significant, the problems are now starting to emerge. And the problems now are actually with the utilities. They've got the problems, so they've got to now try and find solutions for it. So the barrier is not a technical one, but a policy one. It's been a policy one for sure. And, and without policy changes, things are not going to change. They're going to continue the way they are. And we're just going to be paying a huge amount of money for renewable energy without really reducing our dependence on fossil fuels because we're still needing to burn coal or whatever else because we can't predict when the wind is going to be blowing. So, so you formed the company VFuel, which has federal and state government support. And now you're continuing research efforts and looking towards commercialisation. What's the next step for you? Well, for the last five years, with the, with the uh, state and federal government support, we've been able to actually come a long way in reducing the cost, and that's been a critical thing to, for commercial for widespread commercialisation. Uh, we've also been doing further work on our generation two of an aiding battery, for which we have uh, exclusive worldwide licence rights. So, by having now brought the cost down, we are now ready to go into production at least for the generation one initially. We're still doing R&D for the generation two. So we are now looking for actually venture capital funding to try and set up production and or uh, manufacturing partners to license um, so, that they, so that they can. But what we've been actually doing is to identify uh, potential manufacturing partners who are in, in a particular market segment. So for example, we're talking to an Indian company, company right now who, uh, who specialize in providing smaller systems for, for remote area power, for uh, emergency backup power, for telecom applications, you know, for mobile phone towers, for example. They're already into that market segment, and they see the vanadium battery as actually be, being able to expand the market and the capabilities of their systems. So they're very interested in, in licensing the technology for India right now. And we're talking to a Chinese company that you know, they're actually looking at all the different applications, starting from small scale individual houses right up to the large scale wind farms. So here we have a great Australian invention. Do you think we'll ever see it manufactured here in Australia? Well, that's always been my dream, you know. <laughs> Sometimes I feel I've been bashing my head against the wall, but I mean, I'm determined. I am determined to see it one day. You know, we've got to be realistic. At the moment, for small-scale production, we can't really... The cost of automation is just too, is, is just too great as, until we build the volume up. So for small-scale production, really, uh, it's more of a manual labour assembly. And in order to assemble the batteries at the moment manually, we really need to manufacture those in a low cost uh, region, such as India, China. Uh, as we start generating some income from that, and so hopefully we the investment, you know, the, the venture capital companies see that there is revenue coming in, hopefully we'll be able to attract investment company uh, money into the company so that we can then set up automation. And by having automated production, we can hopefully manufacture in Australia and anywhere in the world by then. Well, that would be a wonderful reality so. to see come true. <laughs> I hope so. Maria, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.